So he, he, was, he was one of those that, having done this first paper where he demonstrated there was a, probably not enough baryons in order to explain um, the, the, the temperature of the, of the fluctuations, he moved on from that with the CMB acoustic peaks to realize actually there must be something else like dark matter. And so, so this is the first Nobel Prize, by the way, that I think you could say has also been awarded for dark matter, which no one, I think, is going to question that Peebles has got it. I think um, he quite rightly has got it. But I think you might say it's a shame that Vera Rubin, for example, is no longer here to have also shared in that because of her crucial work in the rotation curves. But, but as an example of his overarching the fact he, he, he was prepared to think of from left field, he, he realized that there needed to be this dark matter in order, first of all, to make the, our, our own Milky Way stable. If you just had baryons in our Milky Way, then in fact you, find, you can show that it's unstable. The, the, core, the, 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 the core of the Milky Way, the, 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 the flat disk, is unstable to, to breaking up. And you need something else like dark matter in there. He did that with Ostriker. And then he made a crucial observation. He suggested, actually, at a time when many people were trying to show that the dark matter was neutrinos, hot dark matter, they weren't working. The, the, the numerical simulations from neutrinos were not matching the observations. He suggested, actually, maybe the dark matter is cold. Maybe it's is made up of non-relativistic particles. And that set a whole movement going, which is still going strong, this idea that we're looking for cold dark matter. And that, that was Peebles. And then a few years later, in the, so that was in the 1970s, he was doing that. So way, way before, you know, observations were really telling you that that's definitely there. In the 1980s, he took seriously the theoretical idea of inflation, the inflationary universe. That idea that in the very first fractions of a second, the universe grew exponentially rapidly. And the consequence of doing that, it forced the universe to, be look, to look as if it was flat everywhere. And he knew that in order for it to be flat, that meant there had to be a certain amount of matter, that, what I just mentioned earlier, the critical amount of matter in the universe for it to be flat. If you added up the, the known matter at the time, the baryons, that was providing me with 5%. He knew that if you added in the dark matter, it was providing me with about another 26% or so. So you got about 30%. He knew there was, taking the inflationary prediction, no evidence for inflation, taking it seriously, he said, we need something else. And he wrote a key paper in, I think, 19, early 1980s, in which he said, maybe we need the cosmological constant in there again. And that was, you know, the cosmological constant wasn't definitively sort of or dark energy wasn't definitively shown until about 1998. And so this, he wrote a paper in which he said, this fits the data the best. When you look at how galaxies are clustering in this paradigm, it fits better than without it being there. And so I think it's a sign of how he's, he's prepared to move with, you know, what, what, where, where the data is taking you, he will, he's prepared to think about it. And, and now, when we've got the whole issue of, is it really a cosmological constant? He was one of the pioneers of introducing the idea that maybe the dark energy is not due to a cosmological constant, but perhaps it's an evolving scalar field. And he wrote a paper in 1988, at the same time I wrote one with David Wands and uh, um, Andrew Little, but he, he wrote one earlier that, with uh, Barrett Ratra, where he suggested actually the cosmological constant might be time varying. And, and that's an example of what's known as quintessence, which is people investigating, you know, all the time now. They're looking at, for evidence of these. So you can see, he, there's no one thing you can say, you know, he's predicted the mass of that particle. He's predicted the, the value of the cosmological constant. He's, he's just demonstrated that in modern cosmology, these are the key ingredients we look like we need. And he, he was there at the start of each one of them playing a role. So he can be, I think, properly regarded as the father of the subject and the expert. <laughs> Places constraints on the number of these black holes that could have been formed at this scale. And that in turn places constraints on the, its contribution to the overall mass of the universe, 